We are involved in a war greater than World War II. We're involved in a war that's far greater with respect to freedom than the freedom of this country. We're involved in a war over the lives and the souls and the hearts and the minds of men and women who we're fighting the satanic forces to set free. Jesus came into this world with a purpose in mind. I'm looking at it. I'm looking at his purpose. His purpose is people. His purpose is to reach to us and express love to us, to break into our world and to give us hope. That we would respond to him and that we would be set free by him. You and I are fighting a world that has a series of messages. A whole host of messages that offer hope and freedom and joy and pleasure and really in the end bring about slavery. We are fighting to break into the forces of wickedness to set people free from the, as prisoners of war. We ourselves have been set free, though we don't live as free as we've been set often. And we declare ourselves slaves often. We have been set free. And Jesus is king, ruler, Lord, and we honor him as such. You know, when Jesus came into the world, people were looking for something. And often, while they were looking for something, they found Jesus. Or they might have been looking for Jesus, and they found a whole lot more than what they expected. I go to the library sometimes, and I don't know, I know there are books there in the library. It may surprise some of you, especially uh, teenagers. There's There's a building called a library. And the library actually has books, not just DVDs that you can check out at periods of time as well, but uh, I'm amazed that this time of year, this week is dead week. And then next week is finals week at Boise State. It's amazing how many students who did not know there was a library on campus are suddenly there and they found it. I overheard one student tell another, do you know there are books in this building? So I'm walking through the library one day in Columbia, Missouri. I had no intention of doing anything except walking through the library. And out of the peripheral vision, I saw this title of a book. And it's like it jumped out and said, Oh, please look at me. I wasn't looking for a book to read, but I saw this book. And it was an interesting book. It was called It Depends. And I pulled it out, and I I said, uh, the first paragraph was something like this. We like to speak authoritatively about the field of communication, as if we know exactly what's going to happen, how it's going to happen, and who's going to respond to what in what way. Communication is not a predictable process, for it involves human beings. And human beings are cognitive creatures who have choice and free will. So... When it comes to predicting human behavior, we have this one answer. Do we know how people are going to behave in particular situations under particular stimuli? It depends. Thus, the book began called It Depends. Captured me. I had no clue. I was going to say every once in a while, I'll come across a book like that. And literally, it comes corner of my eye. There it is. I wasn't looking, and, and it caught me and made a huge life change, like the book called, Is It Too Late to Run Away and Join the Circus? Love the book. It's talking about midlife crisis, and I'm about to hit that someday, I'm sure. (laughs) Not the circus, the crisis. Did I say midlife circus, or did I say midlife crisis? (laughs) Did you say, am I going to hit the circus? (laughs) This is totally unexpected things. Go in the store. Jan has learned not to send me with a specific list because I always come back with more than the list because I'm always finding more than I'm looking for. And often I don't find what I'm looking for. 
or I've forgotten what I was looking for because I misplaced the list. I was trying to remember, and I'm sure I remembered, but when I got home, I didn't get what she sent me for, but I got a whole lot more than what I should have gotten. Did you find everything okay, sir? I love that question. Did you find everything okay? I found more than everything, and it wasn't okay. I'm going home with a whole lot more than what I came for. And so it is, whenever we go out seeking for things, often we find more than what we're looking for, or we forget what we're looking for, or we don't find what we're looking for. The Magi were no different than we. They had been sent with a mission. They understood the signs of the times. They understood the signs of the skies, and God had given them a prophecy, apparently, within their culture, probably through the prophet Daniel. I imagine they've come over from Turkey somewhere, and so they're, they are on their way to Jerusalem and through Jerusalem into Bethlehem because they're, they have found a star. They don't know exactly where that star is shining, so they stop by and ask King Herod, who then calls his wise men together, and they say, well, the scriptures say that the king will be born in Bethlehem, and, and so he sends them to Bethlehem and with this message. When you find him, would you please let me know where he is? For I want to come and worship him as well. And so the wise men say, certainly, we will will get word back to you. And they left. They found the house where Jesus was, not the barn with the animals and the shepherds. They found the house. Tells me we're about a year and a half from the time of the birth of Jesus. The reason I come to that conclusion is because... There's a time lapse between when the Magi, the three wise men, or four or five, or however many there were, there were certainly three gifts. One child was uh, acting in a play and called, and I bring you these gifts, gold, common sense, and fur. (laughs) Oh, if only we could have a couple of those gifts here, right? And so the three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, are offered to the child Jesus. By the way, this is a this is a hefty set of gifts. I'm talking about a very expensive set of gifts. How much gold, how much frankincense, how much myrrh, we don't know, but the wise men from afar came to Jesus and offered up these gifts and they worshiped they worshiped the baby. And the baby they worshipped was in a house. The time lapse between when they found Jesus and when Herod realized they aren't coming back with where Jesus is, he then sends his soldiers into Bethlehem and informs them, kill every male child in Bethlehem, two years old and younger. Which tells me that that's about how old Jesus was when the wise men came to the house to worship Jesus. So they left him with this bounty of gifts. Why would they give him gold, frankincense, and myrrh? Well, for one, it's an offering to a king, right? For another, it's a great act of worship. It's extravagant. It's whimsical, if you want. But there's another reason why. It's very practical. Jesus and his family are about to go on a long journey, and they need to go down to Egypt. And there's not ready work in Egypt. They need some form of support while they're there. And depending upon, if you figure out the cost of gold then or the price of gold and frankincense and myrrh, this might have supported the family for quite some time, maybe even into Jesus' ministry. We don't know. It may have been set aside specifically for Jesus to have at his disposal whenever he needs it. But they used enough maybe in Egypt to survive. Don't know. Speculation on my part. It just seems to make sense to me. The wise men came to Jesus in search of the king. They found the baby. They saw the king. They worshipped him. Herod went searching for Jesus as well, not to worship him, but to kill him. His motive was completely different. Both were searching for the baby child. Both were searching for Jesus prophesied. Both wanted to find him And it was a strong drive to find him, and yet they too had different motives. What motive do we have to find Jesus? You're searching for something in your life. 
you may not realize that he is the one that you're searching for until you actually find him, but you are searching for something in your life. What are you searching for? And how are you looking for it? Well, people often search for Jesus. In fact, we find the next, the next venture of somebody looking for Jesus is in Luke chapter 2. We have Simeon who has devoted his life to God and has been told in a vision or a dream that he would not die until he holds the Holy One in his arms. And when Jesus is brought to the temple, he says, Ah, now it's fulfilled. Anna the prophetess has been searching for the Messiah her whole life. We're even told how long she was married, how long she'd been a virgin, how long she'd been widowed, and then there she is in the temple. Every day she's worshiping in the temple. Why? Because she's searching for Jesus. She didn't know to be Jesus. She didn't know it would be a baby, but she was searching. And when the baby was handed to her as a prophetess, she rejoiced about finding what she'd been looking for. A lot of people came to Jesus looking for stuff. They were searching for him. Leper walking down the road toward Jesus sees him. Son of David, please have mercy on me. Heal me if you would. Please heal me. And Jesus touches the leper and heals him. A, a, a group of friends bring a paralyzed victim to Jesus and lower him down, lowers him down through a rooftop to where Jesus is teaching the crowd. They're seeking for something. They want to see their friend healed. What they hear are, son, your, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, the boy came to be healed. What he received was far greater than what he had come for. I think he said at this point, if his heart is right and he understood what was going on, he would have said, take me home. I got more than I bargained for. I came here for healing, and he gave me forgiveness. Of course, it created a great argument over who does he think he is? God? Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus said, well, let me show you that I have the authority to forgive sins as well, because which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say take up your bat mat and walk? Well, if you count out the words in the way that you say it, even in English, it's easier. It's as easy to say one to, as the other, right? Which is easier to say? Sins are forgiven. Take up your mat and walk. About the same but to show you that when I say this, it really happens, take up your mat and walk. And suddenly the man is healed. And he got up off of his mat, rolled it up and walked through, and they were amazed. And the people, the, the crowds were amazed. The leaders were upset and wondered how they could kill him. People came to Jesus for a variety of reasons. Lord, please heal my servant. Lord, please heal my daughter. Lord, please, I'm blind. Would you give me sight? Lord, please, would you? And they're looking for Jesus for something. What can I get from you, Jesus? A lot of people come to Jesus because of what they see that he offers. He offers me hope. He offers me forgiveness. He offers me peace of mind. I come to Jesus because of all the things that he gives me. Give me, give me, give me. Oh, please, Jesus, bless me. Bless me, Jesus. And so they come to Jesus for what they can get. 5,000 people came out to the desert because they wanted to see the kingdom of God come with power. Now, Matthew is pretty specific about this, but Mark is even more specific about it. 5,000 men, no women or children. 5,000 men, no women or children. What are 5,000 men doing in the middle of the wilderness? And it says... That Jesus taught them, told the disciples, go over here and rest. He taught them all day long, and then he said to his disciples, give them something to eat. Lord, it would cost us 300 days wages just to get enough food so everybody could have a bite of food. Do you want us to give him something to eat? He said, what do you have? Well, we've got these five loaves and two fish. He said, have them sit down in companies in 50 and 100. So they had them sit down, Mark says, in the green grass. Why it's in the green grass? Not sure, it's what it says. And then he lifts up the food and he says, thank you, God. And however Jesus prayed, it's not in the words of the prayer, it's in the thankfulness of the heart. And Jesus brings down the basket and begins to fill up his 12 disciples' 
baskets and they're back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and to companies of 50 and 100 they're taking their baskets of food and dumping it and coming back and they're getting more and people are asking where are you getting all this food and it's delicious i've never had a fish sandwich like this even long johns and it's just back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and i think the disciples are getting tired by now and yet they're learning something aren't they And the people have been fed. Then they want to make him king. In fact, they want to take him by force and make him king. Jesus tells the crowds, go home. He tells the disciples, in the boat, across the lake. And Jesus went up on the mountainside. And he was praying at night. And he could see in the moonlight that the storm had risen and that the the waves were up in the, the rowing across the lake. They hadn't gone very far. And Jesus thought, you know, I I can beat them across this lake. And so he began walking on the water. And as he's walking on the water, they happen to catch a glimpse of him in the moonlight and the clouds pull apart and the waves are going up and down. I don't know, was Jesus going up and down and up and down? Or was he walking steady across the water and the waves were going? I, I have no clue. But they thought he was a ghost. And Jesus says, it's just I. I am he. I am. And Peter said, Lord, if it's you... Call out to me and tell me to walk on water to you, and I'll do it. And he said, come on. So Peter put his foot over the boat and onto the water. And what must that have felt like? And he put his foot over the water, and he stood there. It's solid, and yet not. I shouldn't be doing this, and yet I am. The waves are going up and down, and Jesus and and the, and, the, the, and it's dark, and then it's light, and, and he sees the waves, he feels the wind, and he begins to sink. And a great message can be made about he took his eyes off Jesus, so he began to sink. And, but I want you to think about this now. Jesus reached down and grabbed him, because when Peter was sinking, what did he say? Lord, save me! Lord Jesus, save me! And he reached up. And Jesus reached down and pulled him up. Not only did he stay on top of the water, he pulled Peter up on top of the water with him. Message. Jesus said, oh, where's your faith? Well, his faith wasn't that Jesus couldn't stay on top of the water and pull him up. His faith was that Jesus couldn't work in him to keep him in the water, above the water. But he was seeking. Peter was an open student in class. He was learning things. When they reached the other side of the lake, the crowds on this side of the lake came back to Jesus because, well, he had just fed them yesterday. And his teachings were kind of good. And so they wanted more. They showed up and they said, well, where is he? We saw him go on the mountainside. We saw that the only boat there was there. How did he get across the lake? But he's not here. So obviously he's across on the other side. So they ran around the lake to the other side and when they found Jesus he said the only reason you're here is because I fed you yesterday and you're hungry again and they said well if you would do a sign then we would believe in you we're searching Lord we want to see the Messiah we're searching if you just give us a sign you know Moses Moses gave bread from heaven what do you say Lord would you do that for us Right? Moses did it for them. Would you do that for us? He said, God gave you bread from heaven. And if you know what you're you're looking at, I am the bread of heaven. I am the bread of life. In fact, if you eat my flesh and you drink my blood, you'll never die. I am the bread that God has sent into the world. And... The people did not receive that message. They were looking for Messiah, standing in his presence, and they missed him. They turned their back on him and left him by the thousands. We're told about 4,000. And he turns to his 12 and said, you're going to leave too. Peter, awake in class, he says, where can we go, Lord? Where can we go except you? You have the words of eternal life. They're looking. Their eyes are open. 
They're detectives. They're searching. They're trying to figure out who is this man. And Peter's coming to a conclusion along with the other disciples as well. What's one of the most interesting things is whenever people aren't looking for him and yet they find him. So Jesus comes in John chapter 9 to the, uh, to the beautiful gate as he comes into Jerusalem. And there's a man begging. He's been born, he was born blind, so he's been begging his whole life. And he's not looking for anything except a little bit of money. And the disciples have a theological debate about him. So, Lord, uh, this man's blind. Who sinned, him or his parents, that he should be born blind? And Jesus responded, neither this man nor his parents. This is, this is there for the glory of God. This man is suffering for the glory of God. Now, hear that from this man's ears. First time he's ever heard, he's got something to offer. He's a beggar. He has nothing to offer. He's asking from everyone else, would you take... He's looking for something, someone to take care of him. And Jesus says, this has happened for the glory of God. What? Me? Really? And so he spits on the ground, makes it into some mud, wipes it on the man's eyes, and then says, go wash. And the man goes wash in the pool of Siloam, and as he does, he's able to see... And then he's brought before the Jewish leaders, and you know the rest of that story, but the man found Jesus. The reason I bring him up is because he found what he wasn't looking for. But after that discussion, let's call it a discussion, after the discussion with the Jewish leaders where they kicked him out of the synagogue, he was in the temple, the former blind man, Worshipping God. So there he was, worshipping God. And Jesus sought him out. That's significant to me. File that away for just a moment. Jesus sought him out. So he comes up to the man and he says, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Well, who is he that I should believe in him? Well, you have seen him. And you're hearing him now. And the man fell on his knees and worshipped Jesus. Jesus did not tell him, get up, I'm just a man. He accepted his worship. I want you to see something else, though. Jesus sought him. He looked for him. When he found him, he asked him a very penetrating question. Do you really believe in the Son of Man? And there are only two people in the Gospel of John that Jesus completely revealed himself to and said, I am the Messiah. Do you know who they were? Two very insignificant people. This is one of them, the former blind man, the woman at the well. He told the woman at the well very clearly. He didn't even tell the disciples as clearly as he told these two as far as the record is concerned. People are looking for him. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, John chapter 11. Later there's a party, John chapter 12. Lazarus is there a week later. And then the disciples, or not disciples, but rather some Greek-speaking Jews who apparently are very far away. They live far away. They're Hellenized. They're not speaking Aramaic, so they're not within the Jerusalem region or even the outer regions of Galilee. These guys have traveled a long distance to come to Jerusalem, and they've been hearing things about this man, Jesus. So they came to Andrew, and they said, we'd like to see Jesus, please. And Andrew came to Philip and said, these guys want to see Jesus. And so they bring him, they bring the group, the Greek-speaking Jews to Jesus, and they said, these Hellenistic Jews want to meet you, Jesus. And he says... Now the time has come. There's something significant about the Greek-speaking Jewish people who are searching, specifically searching for Jesus. That was the signal for Jesus. Now the time has come. Glorify your son, God, as 
he has glor- was glorified. And God says with a loud voice from heaven, I have glorified you and I will glorify you again. And the people heard thunder, Jesus heard voice. I maybe think the disciples understood as well. And he said to the crowds, you know, when the Son of Man is lifted up, he will draw all men to himself. As I consider people who search for Jesus and what they found that didn't find in the Gospels, there are two that I want to lift up for you to look at now, and I want to just contrast the two of them. They're in Luke chapter 18 and Luke chapter 19. About the middle of Luke chapter 18, we have a man who came to Jesus, a rich, young leader. And he said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, Why do you call me good? There's no one good but God. And the man said, You know, I understand. And Jesus said, Okay, have you kept the commandments? And he lists six of the ten. And the man, I I see anyway, the man interrupts him. I've kept all these from birth. The commandments Jesus had left out were which ones? Yeah, the first ones. They had to do with God. The relationship with people, he had pretty well kept those, but his relationship with God, well, what's wrong with this rich, young leader? And Jesus said to him, okay, there's one thing that you're lacking Sell everything as you have, give it all to the poor, and then come and follow me. Everything? Everything. Give to the poor. Give to the poor. Follow you? He's rich, he's young. Which tells me this, he knows everything. And he's a leader. Follow? And the man walks away sorrowful. Luke says he looked at the man and loved him. But he didn't run after him. The man was seeking Jesus for a reason. What are you looking for Jesus for? What what do you want from him anyway? Well, the man wanted justification. The man wanted a position in the kingdom. The man wanted others to follow him. The man wanted to be in a position of authority. I believe all of those things were in the heart of this man who was searching for Jesus. Give me these things. Lord, what good thing can I do to have this life that you've been talking about? And Jesus said, well, here's what you're going to have to do. Get rid of all the stuff that is yours. Give it away and follow me. And the man left because the one thing that the man had that was wrong in his life, major thing, was the major thing that we all have wrong in our life. What is it? Everything else is taking the place of God? So whatever it is that you're going to do in order to follow Jesus, what good thing must you do? The good thing you must do is put that aside, give it up to follow him. I love the article that Mark wrote for our bulletin, and I want, I want, if you haven't read that, you need to read it, but he draws from this particular one. Now, I want to contrast this man and his response to another man who sought Jesus. He was just a wee little man. Now, I don't know if he's actually this big or if it was just something that I, as a child, but I saw him as a wee little man when I was little. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he, he... Climbed up in a sycamore tree, the Savior for to see. And as the Savior came, and we did this, right? Because Jesus is walking. As the Savior came walking by, he looked up in the tree and he said, and then we got graphic, Zacchaeus, you come from from there. (laughs) I'm coming to your house today. Actually, he invited himself over for supper. Come on down, I'm going to come to your house today to eat. And Zacchaeus was thrilled. He had gone ahead of the crowds, climbed up into this tree, going out into the inner limb, the, the limb hanging, the inner limb, the limb hanging over the, the pathway where Jesus is walking or the street, and, and uh, he just wanted to get a glimpse of him. I just want to see Jesus. Come on down, I'm going to go to your house today and eat. Called him by name. 
got to bother him. How does he even know me anyway? Somebody been talking about me to him? One of his PR men say, oh, by the way, Lord, the uh, tax collector up on the tree, that's Zacchaeus. Oh, thank you very much. Zacchaeus, he didn't need anybody to tell him, and that's got to blow Zacchaeus out of the water. So they're having this feast in Zacchaeus' home. Zacchaeus is a wealthy man. And the Bible says, Luke chapter 19, Zacchaeus stood up. And you don't usually do that in dinner, because at dinner, in a Jewish home, you're reclining on the floor down to a very low table, somewhat like a Japanese uh, dinner. You know, you have the low table to the floor. Well, they're reclining. That is, their feet are back behind, and they're leaning toward the table, so they're eating like this. And Zacchaeus stood up and said, Lord, look, I'm going to give half of all I own to the poor. And, and if I've stolen from anyone, I'll give them back four times, which, by the way, is what the law says to do. If you steal from someone, you give them back four times what you've stolen. But Jesus, Scripture doesn't say these words. Some manuscripts might add them. Jesus laughed and said, that's what I hear anyway. <laughs> salvation has come to this house today. You know, this is why I'm here. I have come to, hear the words? Seek and save that which was lost. Interesting to me that he did not confront Zacchaeus and say, wait, hold it, that's not the bargain. If you're going to follow me, you've got to sell everything you have. There's no half to the poor. He said, I'm going to give half of all that I own to the poor. And Jesus didn't argue with him and say, no, that's not enough. You've got to give it all. They were both looking for something. The rich young ruler was looking to get something from Jesus. Zacchaeus was looking just to get a glimpse of Jesus. The rich young leader wanted a position. He wanted people to follow him. Zacchaeus became a follower. Zacchaeus opened his heart up to God because of his interaction with Jesus. I want to ask you this. Are you more like the rich young leader or are you more like Zacchaeus? Search your own heart. And every lesson ought to have an application and you ought to have something that you can take and, and wrestle with on your own personal basis. You know, what difference does this message have to do with me? Well, who are you? Are you the rich young leader walking away sorrowfully because you have too much to give up to follow him? Are you looking to get something from Jesus? When Moses turned to the Lord in Exodus chapter 33, he said these things. I want to know your ways. I want to know you. And would you please go with me wherever we go, because otherwise I can't make it. Now that, I think, has got to be the attitude of those of us who are searching for Jesus. That is... I want to know what your will is for my life. That's level one. I want to know you. That's level two. And I don't ever want to leave you. That's level three. I want you always to be with me. There's a difference between seeking the will of God and seeking the face of God. Seeking the will of God focuses on me. Seeking the face of God focuses on God. The difference between a rich young leader... And Zacchaeus is, I want to know what you want for my life. I really want to know you. Philippians chapter 3, one of my favorite passages, this is the end. Paul says, I'd give up anything for one thing in my life. I want to know Christ. I want to know Jesus, the power of his resurrection, I share in his suffering, I'll be conformed to his death, that one day I too might be raised from the dead, not that I've already reached it, 
But I'm looking forward, I'm pressing on to the high calling that's in Christ Jesus my Lord. This one thing I do, forgetting the things that are behind and pressing on to the future. Why? Because Jesus has hold of my life and He, He is my goal. Listen, this is the whole point of this lesson. That Jesus is the goal. It is not what He does for you. All those, those things are important. It is He Himself, who is the goal. I'm looking for Him, not for what I can get out of Him. I'm looking for Him and relationship, not for the benefits that I can derive. That brought me there. You understand? That got my attention. And I was looking for those things, but I got a whole lot more than I was looking for. I came home from the store with my cart full because... I ended up finding that it is Jesus himself, not the things that Jesus offers or the things that I'm going to inherit from him. So the beauty of today's lesson is this. It's now yours. How will you apply it? How will you turn yourself over to him and for what reason? Do you love him? Do you want to follow him all the days of your life? Do you want to know him more than you even want to know yourself? Because if you do and you learn more about him, you will know yourself better than you've ever known yourself. That's a guarantee. Pray with me and we're done. Lord, thank you for breaking into our world and not just coming and, ha- and setting up shop and having us come look for you. You came looking for us. And you continue to look, seeking, breaking into our worlds. Shining in places we never would have expected. Calling us out in ways that we never would have imagined. Offering us things that are far more than we ever dreamed. Thank you for forgiving. Thank you for loving. (laughs) Thank you for being patient. Thank you for being so merciful that we don't deserve, we don't get what we deserve. Thank you for giving us a family. We can love each other and express your love to each other. Thank you for being our hope. So help us get our eyes off of ourselves, off our own belly buttons and onto you. And in doing so, turn our eyes to each other and to the world and bring you, bring you to the world. Lord Jesus, we submit to you in every way and we pray these things in your name. Amen. If you need to come to Jesus this morning, do that please while together we stand. Let's sing.